Hello Forever Family. That, that was the devil right there. He's trying to take me down. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, struggles with anger. My name is Mike. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. The purpose of Celebrate Recovery is to allow us to become free from life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. By working through the eight principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes, we can and will change. We will begin to experience true peace and serenity that we have been, that we have been seeking. <clears throat> through this program, we will restore and develop stronger relationships with others and God. If you are a newcomer, that means this is your first time here. Thank you and welcome. You are the reason we all stand here. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Time for some housekeeping. Locations of the bathrooms, I assume we can all see that. If you can't, we'll have to talk to, <laughs> talk to the DMV. Okay. <laughs> this is a non-smoking campus. We do not judge. We just send you out to the sidewalk. Silence your cell phones, please. This is that time. If it goes off any time after that, we get to give you dirty looks. Yeah. The literature table. We got Ed at the literature table. He's got everything that you need. He's got step study books, Bibles, journals, devotionals. He's got the short one, the long one. He's got them all. He's got everything. So it's Crazy Ed's literature table. And now, special announcements. Hello, Forever Family. Hello. I'm a grateful believer, struggles with codependency and depression. My name is Freya. Hi, Freya. Glad to be with you all tonight. So in the way of special announcements, um, if you are ready to go deeper with the steps, we are doing step studies. Men's step study has already started. It's on Thursday nights. It's from 6.30 to 8 in room 201, which is the upstairs far corner in this building. And they usually unlock that staircase right there and then women we are going to be starting a step study on april 11th so yay woohoo that's that'll be the the sunday after easter and we'll be from 1 to 2 30 and the room is yet to be announced so please um get with me i will be facilitating with rebecca so women women step study contact me and that's it hey mike thank you freya okay now it's time for our readers to come up. Tom, Lauren, you guys agreed to it. You can't back out. He just walked up and asked if I could read. I didn't know he wanted me to actually do it. He asked me if I could read. I said, sort of. Oh, I'll help you. OK. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 13. Step three, we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. God, that is. This is your spiritual act of worship, Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3, 40. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. 
Step seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and become reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10. We continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3, 16. Step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. Through God's grace, lasting change is possible. Give it up for them, guys. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Lim, and I'm a grateful follower of Christ and in recovery from sexual addictive behavior and anger. And tonight, I choose recovery. Amen. All right. Would you guys pray with me, please, as we begin? God in heaven, I bless you and thank you for each man and woman and child that's here tonight and those that are online. And Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would touch us by what you've done in my life and the power that you have over sin. And God, I thank you for this great ministry of Choose Recovery and what impact it's had on my life. Father, I pray you would steady my heart and my mind and my hands as I share this testimony of your goodness in my life. And Lord, we bless you and we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not a very emotional person, so those, I don't know what that, what's going on there. Um, <laughs> Before I share my testimony tonight, I just want to say a big thanks to the staff and the leadership of this church, and uh, they've extended a lot of grace to me, and I'm grateful, and uh, especially um, for my sponsor, Dominic, um, aka Papa. If it had not been for him and for Jesus, I would not be standing before you tonight. So as we begin, I want to declare to you that our God is a God of second chances. Amen. So on December 18th, 1944, the potential for my life began when my father was shot down after bombing Blechheimer, Germany. He and his crew all jumped to safety, but my father broke his ankle, and that was his ticket home. He came back to Georgia, a war hero, and fell in love with a brown-eyed girl that worked in an airplane factory. They got pregnant, then married. I never realized how unnormal my mom and dad's marriage was. There was no wedding album, and I never recall seeing any pictures of their wedding. In the span of 16 years, from 1946 to 1962, they had five kids, I being the youngest, three brothers, and a sister. I don't have a tissue, so this will have to do. 
this okay, it's mine, okay? Nobody else is going to wear this. The raging dysfunction that occurred in our family just seemed normal to me. My father clearly experienced PTSD as a 22-year-old kid from having to endure so many bombing runs. I would guess he was an alcoholic from those war days until the last few years before he passed in 1995. My mom was codependent, also addicted to antidepressants, and occasionally would binge on alcohol to kill the pain of a bad marriage, grief, and her inner woundedness. Tragedy struck our family in 1972 when my middle brother Randy was killed in a freak car accident at the University of Georgia. He was 10 years older than me, and he was, in fact, my hero. It was my brother's death that sent my mom into a downward spiral of depression, which she medicated with Valium and alcohol. Many days during my elementary and junior high school years, I'd come home and find my mom passed out on the couch. Other times, I'd come home and see my dad's car in the driveway, and the engine would still be on, and he'd be slumped over the steering wheel with his cigarette burned down to the filter right in his hand. There wasn't physical abuse in our family, but there were drunk dump trucks of emotional abuse. Most of my siblings were a great source of comfort and encouragement in the midst of the chaos. The summer after my brother passed, I gave my heart to Jesus. I began my journey of following Jesus when I was 10 years old. And though I've had lots of stumbling, sinful mistakes, I've never stopped following him. My first real remembrance of the major struggle in my mom and dad's marriage was when they separated when I was 13. I was devastated by this separation and remember visiting my dad's apartment, and finding a woman's umbrella sitting in the corner. It just undid me. Before their separation, my mom and dad loved to smoke and drink and play bridge, and I used to empty their ashtrays. But sadly, I have few memories of my mom and dad ever being healthy together in affection or emotional connection. When I was four or five, I was sexually abused by babysitters. And when I was seven, a neighbor who was six years older than me tried to force me to give him oral sex. I refused, but it still traumatized me as a second grader. During my college years, I would have two other men sexually violate me while I was sleeping. All of these violations profoundly impacted my identity and my sexual understanding of myself. Though I mentioned I had been sexually abused when I was a young child, I didn't realize it until I was 33 and in an intensive counseling in 2005. My home church and youth leaders became surrogate parents for me. They counseled me, challenged me, discipled me, and encouraged me through my junior high and senior high years. At 13, I made a commitment for Jesus to be Lord of my life. A couple of years later, as the devil would have it, I got exposed to pornography and especially the fantasy stories written inside them. It allowed me to escape from my own dysfunctional and chaotic world to a world of fantasy and unhealthy emotional connection. Even though I was a growing Christian, I continued to struggle with pornography. Through high school, I struggled to get along with my dad as well. My mom used me as her emotional security blanket and tried to, hard to turn me against my father. I had a powerful forgiving moment when I was 16 and on a retreat when the preacher asked the congregation if they knew anybody that they couldn't forgive. Instantly, I thought of my dad. And the preacher said, if Jesus is inside of you, he wants to forgive anyone that you can't. And that night, I asked God to forgive my unforgiveness and to forgive my dad. And God healed my heart toward my dad that night. Ironically, I went to work for my dad during my junior and senior years. He was the director of the local county dump. It was the place that I struggled the most with pornography because it was stockpiled in every corner Yet that dump was also the same place that God called me into full-time ministry. So this roller coaster of a life with a spiritual calling and obedience, peppered with bouts of guilt and shame and condemnation every time I struggle with pornography, were the blueprints of my life. I never engaged in sexual promiscuity in high school because, quite frankly, I was prepubescent. My nickname was Hairless Wonder. You laugh now, but I wasn't laughing then. 
Pornography was my drug of choice to medicate myself from the pain of my abuse and dysfunctional family life. I was saved at 10. Jesus became my Lord at 13. And I was called into full-time ministry at 16. Yet, there was that secret sin of lust, pornography, and masturbation. And I think this is a struggle that many of us have. Though I was a dedicated Christ follower, I tried to do everything I could to overcome this issue of pornography. I was involved in small groups, Bible studies, accountability partners, mentors, but I couldn't overcome. I would say I was powerless and was lying to myself that my life was manageable. Being the youngest of five and a mama's boy, my mom took it really hard when I left for college. During my senior year of high school, my dad decided after multiple affairs and a successful life as a working alcoholic, he would move out of the home and move in with another woman. So during my freshman year, while I was at college, my mother was living alone in the house where she had raised five children and was in a disastrous marriage with an unfaithful man. I remember getting a letter from my mom in the middle of winter quarter, and she said, I realize you have to experience the pain yourself before you can sympathize with someone. That Christmas, my mom took an overdose of Valium, and we had to admit her to a drug rehab hospital. Her life was falling apart, but nobody knew how deeply she had gone into depression. At the end of my freshman year, I came home on a Friday, and the following Monday, my father gave my mom a paper laying out terms of divorce. I remember her reading it and saying, I just might kill myself. And I said, Mom, just get out of the house. Go visit your friends. On Wednesday morning, my mom went into my dad's old bedroom, laid down on his bed, and shot herself in the heart with his handgun. No note, no one around, just sending a message to my dad how badly she was hurting. I was 19, and I remember coming home, going into that bedroom, seeing that wet stain on the bed where the medics had cleaned up, and I knelt at the foot of that bed and I said a prayer, not to God, but to Satan. And I said to him, you killed my mother and I will fight you for the rest of my life. Yeah. Romans 8.28 tells us, and we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Even in her death, I knew God would use this to allow me to help others and to help me trust him more fully. After college, in 1984, I was called to Ghana, West Africa for one year as a short-term missionary. Just before I left, I met the woman who would become my wife. We wrote letters to one another for that year, and when we, re we reunited, we decided to get married. We were married in June of 1986, and I began my master's program that same year. By November of 1988, my wife was expecting our first child. Anna Elizabeth was born on August 2nd, 1989. After the birth, my wife contracted preeclampsia and was put in ICU just 24 hours after delivering our baby girl. The doctor told me she was hanging on by a thread. It was so traumatic to think that my wife could die, sorry about it, at any moment. And I started telling God that I didn't deserve this. My brother was gone when I was nine. My mom took her own life when I was 19. And now as a 27-year-old, I might lose my wife. Yet God spared her. And three years later, we would have our second child, Maggie Allgood, on December 12, 1992. She avoided getting preeclampsia, but was done having children. I don't blame her. We got along fairly well, but my struggle with pornography would raise its ugly head, and my wife would always want me to go get fixed. We never dealt with us, just my issue. I confessed. I went to counseling. I had accountability partners, but never could quite defeat my struggle. We felt called to Ghana in 1998, and we're also praying about adopting a third child. I've always wanted a boy. And as we talked with several leaders, we both agreed we wanted a biracial boy because the child advocacy said that they 
biracial children fall through the cracks more than any other children. God literally and miraculously gave us our son, Matthew Luke Joseph, on August 28th, 1998, a biracial baby boy. I would say for the first 20 years of our marriage, we got along fairly well physically and spiritually, but honestly, we never really connected emotionally. There was a huge absence of connectivity. When we returned to Ghana, from Ghana in 2010, I struggled to reacclimate into U.S. culture. I was floundering spiritually and quite frankly was hating my life back in America. I loved Africa and Africans. I was a man without a continent, but was going to make the best of it for my family. By July of 2012, I was clearly out of control and in my heart and mind felt myself drifting into a place I never thought I'd go. I wanted to be faithful and fearless in my life to my wife, to my family, and to my God. And in late October, I allowed inappropriate texting to lead to a moral failure, and I committed the sin I thought I never would. Though it only lasted three weeks, and I confessed to my wife within two months, I believe it was a hemorrhage that couldn't heal. We spent six years and several thousand dollars in counseling. By January of 2019, I was in a desperate place, and I thought the only option for us was separation. In my recklessness, I was not guarding my heart and spirit, and I failed my wife and my marriage vows. Nobody is ever 100% right or wrong, but I've learned to own my faults in losing my marriage. I never realized how painful divorce is, how far reaching it is in the destruction, not just of the marriage, but of so many relationships. But I also know this, divorce or any addictive behavior, my hurts, hangups, and habits, they do not define who I am. Jesus does. On March 23rd, 2019, I was separated from my wife and my home. On April 8th, divorce proceedings started. On July 9th, we did a mediation. And on October 15th, 2019, we were officially divorced. One of the ironies was my wife's lawyer was from the same firm that my mom had. So when my wife presented divorce papers to me, it was from the same person that my mom had as her divorce lawyer. I never dreamed this would happen to me. But more than it happened to me, I made this happen to me. I own my stuff. Where I failed, I own it now. No excuses. The inability to overcome my addictive behavior in pornography, my decision to break my marriage covenant, and my inability to get control of my secret sin was the downfall of my marriage and, in fact, my ministry. In 2019, I lost my marriage, my home, more than half of my net worth, and many close friendships from my hometown. And I'm now rebuilding the ministry that I felt so called to do. I decided to come here to grace to be with my friend, Pastor George, and with the staff of this church to heal and recover. Praise God. After my second daughter's wedding on June 15th, 2019, I decided to temporarily relocate to this safe, pl safe place, Grace Church. Pastor George and Cheryl opened their home to me and I lived with them for almost five months. When I heard the silence from my friends and family in my hometown, I realized it wasn't temporary anymore. I sensed God was saying that I needed to relocate and start over. I went through divorce care and I started attending Choose Recovery. Things began to change. Every Friday, I faithfully attended CR and spent the first few months in the anger group but then switched to the sexual addiction group in 2020. After a few weeks of attending that small group, I asked Dom to be my sponsor. Walking and working through the 12 steps with Dom and my small group of men was life changing. Every week, I worked through each step, asking God to give me the strength to admit my own weaknesses, to own my own failures, faults, and flaws. Every day, I would check in with Dom, and God allowed me to build more than a sponsor-sponsee relationship he became a friend, a mentor, a papa. Our relationship was deepened when one day I asked Dom if I could come and help 
dig out the sludge and muck out of the creek behind his house. You see, I don't know if you guys know this, but Dom is old. (laughs) And he was digging all this muck out out of this creek by himself, and I couldn't let him die alone. So I thought I'd come over and help him. His wife came out one day, and she goes, really, why are you doing this? (laughs) I didn't want him to die. Although it took 10 months to get through the 12 steps, I learned something. If you work the steps, it works. Every week, we would go deep into every step. Some of them were easy to answer the questions. Others were brutal. Taking a moral inventory was one of the hardest but most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Making amends for those I've offended, I'm still working on. But let me say this. This program, this weekly meeting, This accountability, this relationship with my sponsor has changed my life. I've been walking in freedom from pornography since October of 2019, 15 months sober. (laughs) Glory be to God. I stand before you tonight. As a broken, wounded follower of Christ who has lost his first marriage, lost my identity, and I began a journey to health and wholeness because Jesus believed in me and a 76-year-old New Yorker believed in me and stayed by my side. I celebrate my sexual sobriety from pornography because you all do what you do every Friday. Solo Gloria Deo. As I began my journey of working the steps, I was also going through divorce care. Both were critical in my healing journey. Divorce care lasted from August to November. I'm so grateful for the facilitators that took us through that critical piece of healing for my recovery. After my divorce was completed in late November, I began to text a new friend, and God helped me to establish a new healthy relationship. We started dating on January 1, 2020, and God has deepened our friendship into a dating relationship, and now I have the privilege of calling her my fiance. If I had not been deeply involved in CR, I know there's no way I could have begun a new relationship. Because of the depth of commitment and love that I've experienced from CR, from my small group, from my mentor, I know that I'm healthier in my emotional, spiritual, and physical life. I no longer choose, sorry, I no longer choose to live in shame, guilt, or secrets. Where where I failed in the past, and some of those failures still haunt me, yet I no longer live in the guilt and shame and secrets. I know what right choices feel like. I know what a pure heart does to create clean and healthy relationships now. Men and women, Jesus saved my life, but choose recovery allowed me to redeem my past, to trust the process, and to find a healing and healthy place to live out my life and my purpose. I used to have Jeremiah 29, 13 as my favorite scripture. If you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. But now God's led me to a new deep place that I've never gone And I had I not chosen recovery. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 8 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. As the altar is about to open... I pray you hear the words of the song we will soon sing. You turn mourning into dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You are the only one who can. Men and women, our God is a God of second chances. He wants to take your shame, your guilt, and your condemnation and give you freedom in him. I beg you to give all that you have to him and tonight choose recovery. My name is Michael M., and tonight and for the rest of my life, I choose recovery.
Again, let me reiterate, if you are a newcomer, we are glad you're here. And for the newcomer, we do have what we call Newcomers 101. It's basically what we are and what we are not. If you are a newcomer, head over to the table where Ed's at. Someone will meet you there and they'll walk you through it. Okay, so at this point, we'll be uh, ending large group with the serenity prayer in its entirety after a moment of silence. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship is a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Yeah. Woo! Be back here at 8 o'clock.